So let's take a look now with how to do arithmetic with a given function and different function values and what its geometric significance is or what its significance is in physics and other disciplines. The first concept is the difference quotient and the difference quotient is exactly what it quotient is ratio and difference is subtraction. So a difference quotient of a function y equals f of x on an interval a, b is the average rate of change and is given by the difference of the y coordinates divided by difference of the x coordinates, which means that it's going to be slope of the line that passes through the points a, f of a, b, f of b. So what does that mean? Let's take an example. So uh, the first example here is linear function 5x plus 7. You want to compute f of 3 minus f of 1 over 3 minus 1. f of 3, you know how to compute. Just plug in 3 for x in the original function, so 5 times 3 plus 7. Minus f of 1, which would be evaluating the function at 1, so 5 times 1 plus 7. And then the whole thing is divided by 3 minus 1 or 2. If you simplify, you'll see we get 5, and that's not a surprise because 5 is the slope of the line. And so if we're looking at a line that passes through uh, 3, 22, and 1, 12, then that's this slope of 5. So all the points on this line are going to have slope of 5. And if you look at the difference quotient, which is two separate points on the line, then the slope between them is also going to be 5. So the interpretation of this is the rate of change. Average rate of change is given to you by slope of a line. And so sometimes students have trouble computing difference quotient. If you are one of those, cover all the things that you have to find and do one thing at a time. Don't panic. So here, if you cover all of it, you will only have f of 3 left. So we have f of 3. We compute that. OK, then unhide f of 1. Compute that. Then unhide the b minus a on the bottom. Compute that. And then it's just algebra from there. All right, let's take a look at something that a generic linear function. So in this case, f of 3 would be m times 3 plus b. And f of 1 would be m times 1 plus b. Do the algebra, and you'll see you end up with slope of a line. All right, what happens if you have a quadratic function? So do you see this graph here for y equals x squared? We will focus on some particular values and take a look at what difference quotient is. So if you look at the points 2, 4, and negative 1, 1. Let's take a look at the slope of the line that passes through these two points. So we will have f of negative 1 minus f of 2 over negative 1 minus 2. You can also do f of 2 minus f of negative 1. You will get the same result because whether you do first coordinate or second coordinate does not matter. All right, so if you plug in points, you can see that negative 1 squared is 1, minus 2 squared, which is 4, divided by negative 3, and that gives us 1. Well, what if I take a point a little closer to 2, say 0? So then I will do the same computation, and I'll end up with 2, and that's this second line you see here. What about going a little closer, like 1.5? And again, I'll do the computation here. You can check that for yourself, and you get 3.5, which is this third line you see here. Well, now what? What if I go a little more closer to 2? I'll go to 1.99, and you'll see I get 3.99. If you keep going closer and closer to 2, you will see that those lines are going to have slope very close to 4. This is an important concept in calculus because it allows you to get instantaneous rate of change and not just average rate of change. So the instantaneous rate of change at x equals 2 is going to be 4, whereas the average rate of change between negative 1 when a is negative 1 and b is 2 is going to be 1. Between 0 and 2 values, it's 2.
between 1.5 and 2 is 3.5. And it's the slope of these lines you see here, which are called secant lines. What if we keep the same points, but you take the difference, the number that is away from 2, and let it go closer and closer to 2? You will see these lines get closer and closer to tangent line. So the secant line's limiting value or limiting position is the tangent line. And that is a basic principle in calculus to compute instantaneous rate of change called the derivative. So difference quotient is simply computing the difference of the y coordinates divided by difference of x coordinates, which is slope of the line that passes through the two points on the function. All right, let's take a look at next example. Here you are given a function that represents Avery's ride from the store on her way from school and then going home. Her trip is given by this function, and you are asked to find the difference quotient on the interval and explain what the physical significance of the values you compute here are going to be. And then using these values that you compute in part A, also tell us what is their meaning of what you found in part B, and describe what the function is displaying to someone that is not in your class. So parts B and C we can do together. But pause the video here, and let's see what you think is happening here. See how you can interpret that. Go ahead, pause the video, and see what you can do. And then we'll discuss the solution together. All right, let's try and make sense of what this is. You can see on the y-axis is distance from home in miles. And on the horizontal axis, it's the time measured in minutes. So for example, when you are 20 minutes into your trip, you have at 20 minutes, the distance from home is 9 miles, which means that Aubrey is probably the same distance from home from 10 minutes all the way to 25 minutes, which means that Aubrey has stopped somewhere. And that makes sense. That means that's how long she was in the store. This blue piece, the first piece, when, you, when Aubrey first left school at a steady speed. Steady speed because you can see it's a linear function. The distance is changing per minute or per 10 minutes or per 20 minutes. Just look at the slope. You are going 1, 2. 2 over, which is 10 minutes. And then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, up. So you are going from 4 to 9, which is 5 miles. So in 10 minutes, you went 5 miles. So you have a constant steady speed in the first part, first leg of the trip. Then Aubrey stopped from 10 minutes to 25 minutes. So she was in the store for 15 minutes. And then she came home at a steady speed. And then 40 minutes later, she reached home because now the distance from home is 0 miles. So if you compute the average, which is difference quotient between 0 and 10, you will see it's half a mile per minute, which is the speed at which Aubrey drove from school to the store. Then Aubrey was stopped, so speed was 0, and so the distance didn't change. Then coming home, all the way from 25 minutes to 40 minutes, which is 15 minutes. So in 15 minutes, you traveled from 9 miles to 0. So 9 miles in 15 minutes, or 3 fifths, or 0.6 miles per minute. It's negative because now the distance is reducing towards the home. So. You can see the physical significance of difference quotient here. In the first 10 minutes, you drove an average speed of 0.5 miles per minute, which is 30 miles an hour, probably because of city streets. In the next 15 minutes, the car was stopped, moving 0 miles per minute. And then it took 15 minutes to reach home at an average speed of 0.6 miles per minute, or 36 miles per hour. All right, see if you can do this problem now. Pause the video here and compute parts A, B, and C, and then continue watching the video. We will check the answer with you. Go ahead, pause the video. Let's see what you got. 
So let's take a look at our graph. Again, we have velocity in meters per second and then time in seconds for a particle. So note our first f of 1. f of 1 is 6 meters per second. That means that you're traveling 6 meters in 1 second. And you can do that for f of 2. So go to 2 and up. That's also 6. f of 3 is also 6. 4 is 6. And 5 is 6. So it'll be 6 plus 6 plus 6 all the way to f of 5, which is also 6. So it's 6 times 5, or 30 meters per second, which means that the particle traveled 30 meters in 5 seconds. That's what that means, because time elapsed is 5 seconds, which is also, if you actually look, it's the area of the rectangle, which is length times width, so 6 times 1. So 6 meters per second times 1 second, that's 6 meters. Another 6 meters per second plus times 1 second is another 6 meters. So that's how I know that you've gone 30 meters in 5 seconds. So since the velocity is constant over the first 5 seconds, we can do that. In the last 2 seconds, the distance traveled will be the area under this curve. You can see that we have our triangle here, which is half base times height. The base is 1, 2, 2 wide, and again, 6 tall. So that's this triangle you see here, which fits right there. You can see that, right? So the area of that triangle which would be half 2 times 6, which is 6. So 30 from the first 5 seconds, and then another 6 from the next uh, 5 through 7, another 2 seconds will give you 36 meters total. So the particle has traveled 36 meters in 7 seconds. In other words, if you take the function value, since we are going in increments of 1, just adding these values and looking at the area under the curve, the velocity curve, is actually giving us the distance. This is another important concept in calculus. So we've seen that when you're looking at algebra with a function, you can, for example, take two different values, add them together, divide by two. That'll give you average of the two values. You can also take area under the curve. So if you're looking at velocity function, then the area under the curve is giving you the distance. So a quick review of arithmetic of functions. We started out with doing arithmetic between functions, where the name of the function f plus g means take the two individual functions and add them together. And then we did similar descriptions of subtraction, multiplication, and division of functions. That we looked at with functions, which is difference quotient, which is slope of secant lines. You can also add all the terms, get area under the curve to get distance traveled from velocity function just doing algebra with function values of the same function. In the middle between these two, we looked at what happens when you do algebra within a function like f of x plus 2. In general, then, what happens if instead of x plus 2, I have x squared or some other function? So in other words, we're applying another function first and then putting that as our input for f. So this arithmetic within a function is something of interest to us since we only spend just a little bit of attention to it in this section. The next whole section will be devoted to looking at composition of functions.